Well, turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 3. And I hope you were able to read chapter 3 and 4, reading ahead, because there's a lot of scripture tonight. And, and I do have a lot of verses for you. I hope you picked up notes from last week. And um, the notes for this lesson should post probably Monday if you're um, doing it online. So in Joshua chapter 3, we are talking through the, where I was teaching, going through the book of Joshua, not necessarily verse by verse, but uh, seven weeks of messages about faith. Because Israel is moving out of that wilderness experience. They are coming up on the Jordan River. They're going to cross over into God's land that he has promised them all the way back to Abraham. And something new, it's, they're just on the cusp of a new beginning. Joshua is their new leader. And in that first chapter, we saw that, that admonition to be strong and courageous. And it was not about having a great army or a lot of strength, but it was about being attached to God and being resolute in our thinking about who God is and his nature and his character and understanding that what God says is true. And yet what God says can never be separated from how he wants us to live. We don't just get to reap the benefits of the promises without the lifestyle of obedience that goes with that. And then he promises his presence. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never relax my hands. In that verse 9 of Joshua chapter 1, to be strong and courageous, do not tremble or be dismayed. Don't crack under the pressure. Why? Because the Lord, your God, he is with you wherever you go. God is calling Joshua to a life of faith, trusting God enough to obey him. And then last week, we, we looked at Rahab, and she is that face of faith, the most unlikely person we could imagine to teach us so many great lessons about faith. And we understand that Rahab was, is called a woman of faith all through the New Testament. Rahab the harlot, a woman of faith, James and Hebrews both refer to her that way. And we had to decide, is she a woman of faith because of what she believed or because of what she did? And the answer, of course, is yes. That a life of faith is not just believing something in our head and saying we have faith, but it is believing. And that, be that word belief means to lean into, to have complete confidence, to have trust, and to trust enough to obey. And when God reveals truth to us, we act on the truth. And tonight we're going to look at chapters 3 and 4 because God is going to give Joshua some very explicit instructions about what they are to do from this point on. How they are to move from, from where they are camped in the Acacia Grove or Shittim as some of our translations say. How they are to move from there across the Jordan River. And he's going to be very, very specific. And they would have to trust what God is saying. They're going to have to listen and obey. They're going to have to dig into the fact that God is an unchangeable, faithful God. And he will not lie. He will not pull the rug out from under us. And so we come to Joshua chapter 3. And tonight we are just going to talk about faith. We're going to look at the attitude of faith. The action of faith and the acknowledgement of faith. I have two different outlines for this. So if you want to write this down in parentheses beside those A words in um, the Roman number one, two, three, the, the attitude of faith is revere. And then Roman numeral two, which I believe is on the back of your page, the action of faith is respond. And Roman numeral three, the acknowledgement of faith is remember. So you can do the R outline or the A outline, doesn't matter to me. But let's look at Joshua chapter three as we talk about these principles of following God. The instructions that he's going to give to the children of Israel through Joshua really apply to us in this Christian life as we are women of faith, as we are walking and living by faith. Joshua chapter 3, let's look at the first five verses. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, he and all the sons of Israel. 
And they set out from Shittim and came to the Jordan, and they lodged there before they crossed. And it came about at the end of three days that the officers went through the midst of the camp, and they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God with the Levitical priest carrying it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Verse 4. However, there shall be between you and it a distance of about 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it that you may know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do wonders among you. God is giving some very specific instructions. The Israelites, when this chapter starts, are camped at at an area called Shittim. Another translation says Acacia Grove. It's about seven miles from the Jordan River, and oddly, they have been there for quite some time. They've actually been there all the way back since Numbers chapter 22. And they've been there not knowing that a great spiritual battle was going on around them that God was taking care of. The king of Moab, we don't have time to get in the story, but it is really a great, it's really a fascinating story. The, the whole time they're camping in Shittim, the king of Moab is trying to throw a curse on them. And he uses a false prophet. And it's that story in the Bible about the donkey talking. Well, there it is in Numbers 22, 23, 24, all through there. And so Israel is really oblivious to all this that's going on. But they have been camping there waiting for God's instructions. Moses dies while they are camped at Shittim. God takes him up, I think it's Mount Nebo, and, and, um, and, and, and Moses goes to be with the Lord. And they're waiting. And now Joshua has these instructions. And they move toward the Jordan River. And as they are getting ready to cross the Jordan River, the instructions that God gives to Joshua, Joshua gives to the leadership, and it takes three days for the instructions to go out toward the people. I'm telling you, there were over a million people. Some people, some scholars think upwards of two million people, they're waiting to cross the Jordan River. This is the day they have waited for. This is the newness that they have known was coming. This is the hope that they have been clinging to. And now they would follow God into a new land. But following him was not going to be a casual stroll. It was not going to be a flippant walk. It was a a walk of faith. Not their own way, not their own idea, not their own path, but following specifically the path that God gives them. And they would have to follow with the right attitude. When we come to those first five verses there, we're going to see this. We see this attitude. The instructions say, Joshua, you're going to set out, and the Ark of the Covenant is going to go before you. Now, if you're new to Old Testament study, the Ark of the Covenant, it was first introduced to us in Exodus chapter 22, which is 25. And and if you ever ever saw an Indiana Jones movie, (laughs) it is a poor substitute for the truth of Scripture. But great care was always taken with the Ark of the Covenant because it was a physical representation of the presence of God. It was, by some people's description, the throne of God. It went everywhere the Israelites went. In Exodus 25, the instructions were given that an ark, a chest of acacia wood, was made. And it was overlaid with pure gold, both inside and out. Four rings, and this is important, four rings were attached, one at each corner, and into those rings, poles were inserted, made of acacia wood, covered in pure gold. The poles were never removed. Anytime the ark was transported, it had to be transported by the priest, and they could not touch the ark itself. They were to lift it and carry it by the poles. 
It was a sacred piece of furniture. It was housed within the tabernacle. That Even the high priest did not touch it. On, in Leviticus 16, we see that on the Day of Atonement, the most high and holy sacred day in the life of Israel, the priest would sprinkle blood on the ark. Not specifically on the ark, but on spe- specifically on the mercy seat. On top of this gold box, a seat was fashioned, and on either end of the seat were cherubims or angels. Their wings were pointed up, and their faces were pointed down, looking at the mercy seat. And Psalms 81 says, God sits on the mercy seat. And inside the ark were the tablets of the law that Moses had had chiseled out when he broke the others and he chiseled out. They were inside the ark and they were directly underneath the mercy seat. There was also a a jar of manna and Aaron's rod that had bedded there. Everything about the ark was symbolic of what God had done for Israel. But ladies, let me tell you, everything about the ark tells us something about Jesus. It was a holy thing, and they were to follow it. 2 Samuel chapter 6 is, is an unusual passage of Scripture. When you come to David to verse 3, and, and, and this is moving up in the history of Israel for just a minute. But David is now the king of Israel, and the ark has not come into Jerusalem, which is going to be his home and the capital. And he wants to move the ark to Jerusalem. And when you look at 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 3, it says, And they put it on a cart. Wasn't how they were supposed to carry it. And when they got to someone's house, the ox stumbled, and a man who was there with them named Uzzah or Uzzah reached out to steady the ark so it wouldn't fall off the cart. And it says the anger of the Lord burned against him, and God struck him dead. And David who was so excited about having the ark in Jerusalem, was confused, and he was even angry at God for doing this, and he left it where it was for three months. He wouldn't touch it. He wouldn't get near it. Then the Bible says the home that it was left in prospered, and God was with those, that family. And after three months, in verse 12 and 13 of 2 Samuel 6, David decides to move the ark, but this time it says the bearers, they did it right. And instead of dancing along the way as they were the first time in joyful celebration, verse 13 says they stopped and worshipped. King David thought he was doing the right thing. He was excited about it, but there was something about his attitude that had to be readjusted, and it seemed so severe to us. But going back to Joshua chapter 3, this ark was supposed to go in front of the people. It was to be carried by the priest. And it says that they were to be 2,000 cubics in front of the people. A cubic is 18 inches. So that means 3,000 feet or 1,000 yards in front of these million people, more than a million people. It was a sign or a symbol of a reverent fear for God. They were not to come close. Certainly, it was also directional. They had to be able to see it. They were not to crowd around it. They were not to get up close to it to block anybody's view of the ark. But I think the primary purpose was that they would not get near it. That there was to be an awesome fear of God. And I want to tell you something. We chafe at that in our culture. And yet the word God-fearer is used all through the Bible. It means a positive attitude of reverence that affects every area of our lives. A positive attitude of reverence that affects every area of our lives. To revere, to be afraid in a respectful, reverent way of God. 
in kind of a silly way, I remember my younger son, who was just such a ringtail tutor, when he was in second grade, his teacher was a retired military man. And even, even his teacher had a hard time with my son. And I asked Michael one day, I said, did you ask Mr. Ward about that? And my little son, who was not afraid of anybody, says, Mom, I'm just a little bit afraid of Mr. Ward. And that was like the best news I'd heard all year. <laughs> was it that Mr. Ward had ever hurt him or abused him? It was that he commanded a respect. And Micah acknowledged that even as a, a seven-year-old boy. But in this incidence, God is leading. He loved them. He chose them. They were his people. But guess what? He was not their buddy. And he's not ours either. Somehow in our casual culture, we have to recapture and recognize the holiness of of God because he hasn't changed holiness does not mean vindictive does not mean wrathful I've said this so many times I want you to hear me one facet of God does not diminish another facet of God one attribute of God does not minimize another attribute of God he is fully holy fully righteous fully love, fully merciful, fully good. And I know we often sing about the goodness of God and we want him to be represented to us as a loving father, but we have to get back to an understanding of the holiness, the purity of God. Because God no longer rests on the mercy seat of the ark. God indwells us in the person of the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. And he hasn't changed. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 6. We have a lot of scripture to look at tonight. And, and a lot of it is, is just kind of this heavy idea of holiness. Isaiah chapter 6 is Isaiah's vision. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord. And guess what? When Isaiah saw the Lord, he didn't run up and hug him. He didn't jump on his lap and ask him all the questions that he ever wanted to have answered. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exhausted, exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. And one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. That holy, 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 that three times there, in the Hebrew, there is not a superlative degree, like holy, holy, or holiest. So they say it three times. So holy, holy, holy is the highest degree of holiness. The whole earth is full of his glory. In verse 4, And the foundation of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out, and the temple was filling with smoke. In verse 5, And then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When Isaiah saw the Lord seated on the throne, it wasn't a celebration. It wasn't a party. It wasn't a big service. It wasn't a band playing. It was falling on his face saying, Woe is me. I am undone. I am falling apart because I see the holiness of God, and then I see myself, and I am a sinner sinful man in the presence of a holy God and the society the culture I live in is a sinful culture 
And God doesn't leave him there. But he takes that angel, takes that hot coal and puts it on his lip. And he says, your, your sins are forgiven. So God is not interested in us groveling. But he is interested in readjusting our focus so that we see him. And as we see him, we see us. And then I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 1. You say, Jennifer, that's so Old Testament. That, that, that Isaiah passage, that is so Old Testament. You know, God, there's all those, that smoke and trembling and all that. That's just old. So go to Revelation chapter 1. This is John's vision. John, the beloved. John, the disciple that Jesus loved. John, the youngest of the disciples. He is now an old man. He is exiled on the Isle of Patmos. He has been a pastor. And God gives him a vision of the last days. And yet in this vision that he is about to have, it is a vision of the glorified Christ. Look with me in verse 12 of chapter 1. I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, which are the church. And in the middle of the lampstands... There was one like a son of man. There was one in human form. He was clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet, and girded across his breast with a golden girdle. And his head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. And his feet were like burnished bronze when it has been caused to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. And in his right hand he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Verse 17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he laid his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one, and I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Ladies, this is not the baby in a manger. This is not the gentle teacher on a hillside. This is not the dying form on the cross. This is not even the Christ who has ascended. This is the glorified Christ. And when John, who has walked with him, who has seen him, who has talked with him, who has lived with him for three years, when John sees him as he is now, John falls on his face as a dead man. Because he is catching a glimpse. He is seeing a vision of the holiness, the majesty, and the might of Christ. In our culture, in the American culture, in the westernized train of thought, we have tried to tame the Lion of Judah. We have tried to make the mighty king of glory into a grandfather. We have tried to minimize his holiness so that we can accommodate our own sin. And Joshua is telling the people of Israel, don't come near. There is an awe and a reverence and a respect because God is holy. And then not only in that attitude of reverence, is, do we, we also have an attitude of submission. When we have readjusted to see the holiness of God, we finally see our great need. It is what Isaiah did. It is what John did in Revelation. It is, it is not groveling and saying, oh, poor pitiful me, I'm so unworthy. It is saying, I, I submit. I surrender. And we don't even like those words. We, we want to think that we can still pretty much do what we want to do and God's going to be okay with that. And yet, go back to Joshua chapter 3. And looking at verse 4, that distance that they were supposed to keep, and look at the very last line of verse 4. For you have not passed this way before you don't know the way you have never lived one moment of tomorrow 
You have not lived the next moment. When we come to that realization that God is who he is, that he is the Lord, that he is holy, that he is mighty, that he is majestic, it kind of takes the wind out of my own selfish pride. Say, I got this one, God. I got it. As a nation, they had never been into Canaan. They didn't know the way. Only God knew the way. They would have to give up their agenda, their ideas, their will, and they would have to follow. And to follow then and to follow now requires two things. It requires complete confidence in a trustworthy God. Confidence. And then it requires humility. A good definition for humility is declaring my total dependence on Christ. That's a good definition for humility. It's not doormat mentality. It's not letting everybody walk all over me. It's, all, it's not the all shucks mentality. It is me declaring that I am totally dependent on Christ. James chapter 4, verse 6 says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That word opposed means God is in an aggressive position to come against the proud. Why? Because the proud haven't surrendered. Pride is the sin of Satan. When you go to Isaiah chapter 14 and then Genesis chapter 3, and that he has perpetrated that on the human race, and we have bought it hook, line, and sinker. I can do this my way. I can do it without God. I got you in my back pocket, God. You just hang in there. I'll pull you out if I need you. But we have to have, an, we have, to have an attitude of submission. I came to this verse this week as I was studying, and I, I just was so burdened. But I was, also, I was also reminded of something. The first time I ever taught Joshua chapter 3 was on a Wednesday night in Knoxville, Tennessee in September of 2005. And I taught on that Wednesday night, you have never been this way before. Follow because you've never been this way before. And I told some funny little stories about following and, you know, directions and blah, 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 blah you know, asking for direct. Of course, that was before we had maps and GPS and all that kind of stuff. Because I was always great at giving my husband directions. I talked about that, and it was so funny, and, and they all laughed, and... and what I didn't know is five days later, I would be a widow. And God so gently reminded me in those horrific days, you've never walked this way before. You've never passed this way before, Jennifer. You've never lived through this before. And in those grief-laden days, God says, I'm right here. And folks, when we are walking in something we have never walked through before, it, it can be frightening, disconcerting to be sure. But when we are walking through those kinds of events and those kind of days, it is not a time to rebel. It is not a time for anger. It is not a time to withdraw from the very one who knows the way. And for me, in those days, I heard so many times the Lord just saying to me, Jennifer, follow me, lean into me, trust me. I know the way, even through the valley of the shadow of death. Israel would have to follow, completely trusting, because they didn't know the way. And then that attitude of personal holiness Look back at verse 5. And Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Consecrate is first used in, the, in Exodus chapter 19, and it, the instructions that came with it when God told the people then to consecrate themselves was to wash their clothes and take a bath. It was an external act symbolizing an internal condition, cleanliness, purity. The Hebrew word is kadesh. I'll put it in your notes, but it's Q-A-D-A-S-H. 
Kadesh. It's a verb. It's an action word. And you remember from basic high school English or junior high, an action word, a verb is an action word. It, it is you're doing something. And so to sing new. God was doing a new thing, and it says he was going to do wonders among them like this generation had never seen. That word wonders is the same word that's used back when it's describing the plagues coming out of Egypt. Wonders, miraculous things that can only be attributed to God. And if you want to walk in this and experience this, be clean. God is serious, listen to me, God is serious about our personal holiness. Especially when he is doing something new. I want to be very careful here. And I don't want to get too deep. I heard Pastor Tony say Sunday morning, sometimes I can make something way too complicated, and I can too. But I don't want to make this complicated. You remember when we studied Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, in that list, and it says, you have been chosen, holy and blameless. That word holy means set apart for God's use and sharing in God's purity. That word blameless that is in Ephesians 1, 4, is means without spot or blemish. It was a technical term that designated an absence of anything amiss in a sacrifice that would deem it unworthy. So when Paul says that in Ephesians 1, 4, he said, you are chosen and God declares you holy and blameless. That's your position in Christ. When God sees you, he does not see you as some writhing sinful worm. He sees you in a position of holiness and blamelessness. You are holy and blameless. That's what salvation does for you. That's what grace does for you. It changes your status. It transfers you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And so now as residents of the kingdom of light, we are, we are commanded and we are equipped to live in that holiness and to live a holy life. And God says to us like he says to them, Kadesh, consecrate yourselves, live a holy life. Does that mean i got to get saved over and over and over and over again? No, it just means that there is this daily need for washing. It's very much like that picture, and we don't have time to go all the, the innuendos of it, but when Jesus washed the disciples' feet in the upper room, and he went to wash Peter's feet, and Peter said, oh, no, 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 you're not washing my feet. And Jesus said, well, if I don't wash your feet, you can't have anything to do with me. And so Peter said, well, then just give me a bath. I love Peter. <laughs> I'm married to a Peter. <laughs> that personality, and, and it's, it's always exciting. And Jesus said to Peter, Peter, you don't need a bath. You're already clean. You're already part of the family. But you need your feet washed. You need the junk of the day wiped off your feet. A daily cleansing. They, the people of Israel weren't getting saved again. They weren't becoming God's people again. They were already God's people. They already had a position of being his people, just like you and I do if we're believers in Christ, based on, on what grace has done in our lives. But we are told to live a holy life to be consecrated. Go with me, and I want you to see this. 1 Peter, New Testament. 1 Peter, toward the end of the New Testament. Chapter 2, verse 9 through 12. Whew, we might not get through this one. Hmm. Peter is using a lot of Old Testament terminology here to describe believers. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. That, here's your purpose in being that, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against your soul. Not your spirit, not your salvation. But they just war, they war with the inside of you. When, you. when you succumb to sin, 
that sin that First John talks about, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the boastful pride of life, when you toy with that kind of stuff, it creates conflict on the inside of you. That's your soul. It's not jeopardizing your salvation, but it is causing conflict within your soul, and that conflict within your soul affects your behavior. So in verse 12, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, on account of your good deeds as they observe them, glorify God. Why do we live holy lives? To be do-gooders? To be better than thou, to be self-righteous? No, because we have a responsibility that by the way we live, we are proclaiming the glory and the excellence of God. We are representing God to a lost world. When they look at us, they're not going to see odd for God, but they are going to see a people who obviously live differently because of the Christ who lives within them. And God is very much concerned about personal holiness. When he is doing something new, he requires it. We don't have time to read it. I have it in my notes, but uh, I'll put it in your notes next time. But do you remember that story in Acts? In Acts chapter 5. Ananias and Sapphira. What's going on in church history? The Holy Spirit's just come. The church is just being formed. It is a new day. It is a new time. And here comes this couple. And they conspire with one another to sell a piece of property and then lie about how much they sold it for so that when they give the money to the church, they're going to say it's more than that this is the whole amount of the property that they sold when they really kept some for themselves. Well, so Ananias goes in first. And he presents the money. And he says, well, this is all of it. This is everything. This is what we sold the property for. And it, the Bible says God struck him dead right there. They covered him up and drug him out of the back door. And then she walks in. Sapphira says, yeah, that's it. That's what we sold. The whole We sold. This is the whole amount. Struck her dead. And you say, why would God act that way? Because God's name was on the line. He was doing something new. The church was, was fresh. The Holy Spirit had just come. And personal holiness within the life of a believer matters. I want to tell you something. As I studied this, I just laid on my desk and wept. Because I believe the church In America, the church in Florida, the church in Venice, the church in this room needs to come to grips with God wants to do something new. But as long as we are living like we want, as long as we are entertaining sin, as long as we are are just turning a blind eye to evil and saying, oh, God doesn't really care. It's just who we are. It's just our culture. As long as we are living like that, God is not going to do wonders among us. I am not here to police you. I'm not here to give you a list. I'm not here to say these are do's and these are don'ts. I, and I pray, this is what I just wept. I said, God, I cannot, no matter how fervently I present this information, I cannot drill it into their heart. Only the Holy Spirit using the word of God can press this into us. Psalm 139 says, search me. Search me. How does God search a New Testament believer? He uses the word of God. The spirit of God uses the word of God to teach us the will of God and the ways of God. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says, The word of God is living and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces as far from the division of the soul and the spirit of both joint and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Your behavior might be great and your thoughts and intentions might stink. And the only person that can show that to you is the Holy Spirit through the word of God. When the psalmist says in 139, search me, O God, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any, listen, hurtful way in me. You know, I always thought that man, I always thought that man, if I was hurting somebody or if I was doing something to hurt somebody or if I was hurting somebody's feelings, if I was being mean to my neighbor, a hurtful thing means something I have allowed to form in my life That has become an idol. 
And you know what? We don't even know what our idols are anymore. It could be a train of thought. It could be the way we talk to ourselves. Because you know you're always talking to yourself. You know that, right? I just don't do it out loud, but you are. Your brain is always saying something. Perhaps we've trained our brains to think a certain way, to default to something. That we've set that up as an idol. It's a hurtful way. And we don't even recognize it. We don't even know it anymore. And the psalmist is saying, search that out, God. Reveal it by the truth of your word and the Holy Spirit so that you can dig it out. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That word confess means we are simply agreeing with God about what is sin. We're not giving God new information. We're just agreeing with what he already knows about us. And then it says, not only does he forgive us, but he whoop, cleanses, Kadesh. He cleanses us from every unrighteous thing that we have stored away in our lives, that we have pushed into our brain, that we have allowed into our homes. And I could go off right here on some things that just irritate the hound dog out of me. but I'm not going to because you know what? I'm not your Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's your Holy Spirit. And if they were ever going to step one foot into the promised land in the blessing of God, they had to go first with the right attitude, reverence, submission, never been this way. And consecration, personal holiness, evaluating, taking stock of what is in my own heart and mind, asking God to clean it out. And now they're ready to go. They're ready to take that step. And when we get to Joshua chapter 3, verse 7, Now the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. And then he gives the instructions. You shall moreover command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, when you come to the edge of the water of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. Now let me give you a little insight of what's happening. Remember Rahab had the flax on her roof? It was harvest time. It was spring. The Jordan River normally is, a, is not very wide. They could have just walked right on across. But in the spring, it is flooded. It is over a mile wide. For a while, I lived in southern Illinois. And going from Paducah, Kentucky, over the river into Illinois, I would see that river flood occasionally. It was the most terrifying thing to drive over that bridge in that flooded river because it went from a normal river many times to several miles wide. The Jordan River was flooded. This was not going to be a little skip across. And he says, when the priests take up the ark and you come to the edge of the water, you shall stand still in the Jordan, verse 9. And then Joshua said to the sons of Israel, come here and hear the words of the Lord. By this, he says in verse 10, you will know that the living God is among you and that he is assuredly dispossessing from you, and he names all these Canaanites in the land. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over ahead of you into the Jordan. We'll come back to verse 12, verse 13. And it shall come about when the soles of your feet, the feet of the priest, who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, and the waters which are flowing down from above or from the north shall stand in one heap. And it came about when the people set out from their tents to cross the Jordan with the priests carrying the ark of the covenant before them. And when they carried the ark, they came to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests carrying the ark were dipped into the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks all the days of harvest, that the waters which were flowing down from north, from above, stood and rose up in one heap a great distance away in Adam, the city that is beside Zarethan, and those... 
and those which were flowing down toward the Sea of Arabah, the Salt Sea, were completely cut off. So the people crossed opposite Jericho. And the priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel crossed on dry ground until the nation had finished crossing the Jordan. I just love that story. Specific instructions, right? The priests carry the ark, and they are to go to the edge of the water. And as soon as they step into that water, the water is going to stop flowing. The archaeologists and the, and the people that know more than me said that place where it stopped flowing was 17 miles upstream, and it stood in a heap. And I have read critics of Scripture say that that was a natural occurrence. But even if it was... Can you imagine the timing of it? <laughs> and when the priest's feet touched the water and it stopped flowing, the ground was dry enough as they stood in that Jordan River bank that the people, this more than a million people, crossed to the other side. It is reminiscent of what? The Red Sea. That happened in Exodus as they came out of Egypt. But guess what? That whole generation is gone. This is a new generation. They didn't see it or they don't remember it. And so God is doing new wonders. He is doing a new thing in this new day. And now they would have to follow. They would have to do something. And you know what I would have probably said? Because I know me. God, that is going to be so great. It's going to be awesome. And you know what? When I see that it's going to all work out, I'll start packing up and getting ready to go. (laughs) Don't we do that? When I see all the pieces come together, when I really see that this is it, that it's going to work, then I'll I'll believe you and I'll follow you. But right now, I'm just going to sit here and make sure. You know when that happened? As the people were moving toward the flooded river. As the priests were moving toward a flooded river. It didn't all dry up. And then they packed up their tents and their family and their kids and their stuff and started moving. They had to be ready. They were in the process of moving. Go with me to Luke chapter 17. We're going to go just a few minutes over. Is that okay? We started kind of late. If you have to go, just, you know, you can go. I won't take roll or take names. Familiar story, the ten lepers that Jesus heals. Remember that? We tell that in Sunday school to all the little kids. We tell it, you know, the ten, they all get healed. And then one came back and said, thank you. And we always teach children that, you know, this is a story about saying thank you. It's not. Let's see if we can figure it out. And it came about while he was on his way to Jerusalem that he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. You remember the Samaritans were the hated ones, the northern tribe that intermarried and became a another people group called the Samaritans, and he entered a certain village, and there met him ten leprous men who stood at a distance. And they raised their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said to them, Go, show yourselves to the priest. Now catch this. And it came about that as they were going, they were cleansed. Did you catch that? As they were going, go show yourself to the priest was, a, was what they had to do after they had been healed to demonstrate that they could go back and live with regular people. And so Jesus says, while they are still full of leprosy, go show yourself to the priest. But all ten of them, now I know one comes back, and the one that comes back is a Samaritan. There's so many lessons for us to get in this, so many pictures for us to see. But in this particular case, I believe... The main one is that as they were going, they were healed. They believed who Jesus was or they would have never cried out for him to heal them. And he gives them instructions that make no sense. Go show yourself to the priest. Well, you know what? I'm pretty sure if I were one of those lepers, I would say, well, I can't. I'm not healed. Why don't you heal me and then I will go show myself to the priest. When I see that it's all going to work, when you're really going to do what you say you can do, when it really is a reality, then I will go. But guess what? 
That's not faith. But faith is not a leap into the dark. Faith is obedience to what has been said, the truth of the word. Jesus gave them a word. He told them to do it, and they were to obey, even though it didn't quite make sense. And as they were in the process of going to the priest, they were cleansed. They were healed. It was the same with the people of Israel. It wasn't all going to work out, and then they crossed. They were moving toward a flooded river. But let me tell you something, ladies. If God has said do it, we do it whether we understand it, whether we see all the pieces, whether we know the big picture, whether we see the ending. If God says do it, we do it. And then it's up to him to work it out. And the Bible says they crossed on dry land. It was a monumental experience. And he didn't want them to ever forget it. And so he's going to help them remember. We come to chapter 4. And certainly we don't have time to read the entire chapter. But back at verse 12 of chapter 3, God told Joshua to pick 12 men from every tribe. And that's going to be reiterated now in chapter 4. In verses 1 through 8, God tells Joshua, take for yourselves in verse 2 in chapter 4, 12 men from the tribes, one from each tribe, and command them, saying, take up for yourselves 12 stones from here, out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. And just to paraphrase the rest of the story, Joshua chose 12 men, one from each tribe, and they went into the middle of that dry river bank that was just moments before flooded, and the priests are still standing there. And the Bible says the priests stood firm until everything was completed. And the men picked up rocks, and they were not small rocks. They, it says they carried them on their shoulders, and they were to take them across the river to the place where they would camp. And we're going to look at this more next week, but it's a place called Gilgal. Gilgal became the point of operation for taking the land of Canaan, became the base camp. And they set up these 12 boulders there to form a memorial. It's interesting to me that in verse 9, Joshua himself goes back into the river and stacks up 12 stones all by himself in the middle of the river. And there's really nowhere that we see God telling him to do that, but he did it. Knowing that as soon as those priests move and the water comes back, nobody will ever see those stones. But I think Joshua was doing it for himself. We don't know. I'm speculating. Joshua is making his own memorial. That this was a day that the Bible says God elevated him as leader. So go with me now to verse 20. You can go back and read all of chapter 4. It's just fascinating to me. Verse 20 of chapter 4. And those 12 stones which they were taken from the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the sons of Israel... When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed, just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea when he dried up before us until we had crossed, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that you may fear the Lord your God, forever. That memorial, those 12 stones, a memorial is a remembrance. It is so that we don't forget something. And so this memorial was set up, and it had a threefold purpose. It was to be a reminder to the adult Israelites who had crossed that Jordan River and taken their families and followed the ark and followed the instructions and watched God do wonders. It was to be a reminder to them of who God was and what he had done. But it was also to be a teaching tool for their children and for future generations. They were to tell their children about it. They were to explain what had happened. They were to talk about it around the dinner table. And then the third thing, it was to be a testimony to the lost world. 
A reminder to those Canaanite people when they saw that stack of 12 stones of what God had done for his people. Ladies, I want to end with something pretty practical tonight. When God's done something in your life, when he has asked you to be obedient and you've been obedient, do you remember it? Do you somehow memorialize it? And I don't mean worship it. I don't mean build an altar to it. But we are so prone to forget what God has done in the past. We are so prone to get anxious. We are so prone to become afraid. We are so prone to be forgetful. We are so prone to become angry with God when something changes or a mishap happens. We are so prone to fear. And God is saying, he, we read in Psalm 77 last week, the, the psalmist was, was kind of angry with God until he looked back and remembered the faithfulness of God and what God had done. Those memorial stones were to be a refocusing of Israel. When they became afraid, when the enemy looked overwhelming, when they weren't sure what was going to happen, when there were questions about the next day or the next move or the next battle, they could look at that stack of stones and say, God did a wonder among us. Why would he leave us? Why would he forsake us? So what are some of your memorial stones? Do you go back to them? Do you remember a time in your life when God did something for you? I have memorial stones in my life. Most of my memorial stones are connected with a verse of Scripture. And I tend to, to write in my Bible a lot. And all through my Bible are markings in my Bible. On this day at this time, God gave me this promise. And I, it is not a name it and claim it thing. I'm just saying it, it during a time of study and prayer, it was just like God just shone a light into a promise and said, this one's for you. Hang your hat on it. Isaiah 43, 1, I have called you by name. You are mine. I was 32 years old. I was questioning and doubting my salvation. And God said, look back. And when I looked back, I remembered what I knew as my salvation experience as a nine-year-old child in, in Delray Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama during a revival meeting. And, and I sat there just as the preacher's kid who knew everything. And, and in the invitation, and we did invitations in the Baptist Church where you respond to that message. And during that invitation, I promise, I promise, I heard God call my name. I thought I heard everybody in the building. I, I knew everybody in the building heard him call my name. I thought my daddy was calling me down again for talking. But I knew God was calling my name. And I didn't know exactly all that it meant. And I went and I, I just fell in my daddy's arm. And I told him, I said, God, call my name. My daddy knew exactly what had happened. I don't remember what I prayed. I don't remember what I said. I don't remember anything about it. I just remember that. And so now, fast forward, 32 years old. I'm a new pastor's wife. I'm a young mother. And I am being hammered with doubts. That I am somehow not really a Christian. That I've just grown up in this Christian stuff. And somehow I don't even know the Lord. And I was so belabored and, and burdened with doubts about my salvation. And that day I went to the mailbox. And in the mailbox was a magazine that a friend of mine that I have never talked to since sent me. It was printed on the front. was Isaiah 43.1. Do not fear. I have redeemed you. I called you by name. You are mine. And in my Bible, there are stars and parentheses and exclamation points around that verse. And do you know, Satan not once has ever bugged me again about my salvation. Because I have a memorial stone in Isaiah 43, 1. He called me by name. And in Colossians chapter 4, in verse 2 and verse 17, I was in Arkansas leading a women's retreat in, 19, in, in the year 2000. And I was sick as sick as sick can be. And I sat in that room and I cried and I cried and I cried. I said, God, I just want to go home. I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to travel. I don't want to be away from my kids. I don't want to do this, God. I don't want to do this. And I was prostrate on the floor crying out saying, let me off the hook with this kind of ministry. And my Bible reading that morning, I didn't go to this passage. It was just in the, in the way that I was reading the Bible that morning. I came to Colossians chapter 4 and verse 17. And it says, do not neglect the ministry that's been given to you. And then he took me all the way back up to verse 2. Devote yourself to prayer. 
Those are memorial stones in my ministry. You look in my Bible, they're marked. Psalm chapter 20 is a memorial stone when my second son was born. Matthew chapter 7 verse 25 is a memorial stone the night my husband died. I have memorial stones all through my Bible that I can go back to and see what God has done. And I have been convicted even this week as I've been studying that I need to write these down and share them with my children, my grown children, because I don't think they know about my memorial stones. Memorial stones can really be anything. They can be your journals where you keep an account of what God has done for you in your life. They can be passages of scripture. I have a real rock here. It's been sitting on my dresser since 2017. And I picked it up today and I went, yeah, I wrote on it in 2017. I wrote 1 John 5, 13 through 15. And so I went back, I looked it up today. And it's about God answering prayer. And then it has the word Cuba, October 15th, 2017. And so I went to my phone because I thought, what happened there? So I went to my phone, and I've got like 6,000 pictures on my phone. And so I, I did the search for this date, and I was in Cuba. It was the first time that my book, Women of Grace, translated into Spanish, had been used teaching women in Cuba. And I had written this verse about praying within the will of God. Do you know writing a book was never on my radar? Ever. Ever. <laughs> Much less having it translated into Spanish. Never dreamed of going into Cuba. And yet God had a plan that I didn't know about. And it's a memorial stone. That when God says, do this, Jennifer... And I don't know or understand or see the reasoning or question it or I'm not sure about it. I just have to go back to my memorial stone. So you don't have to understand. If God said do it, you just do it. Remember the memorial stone? So yes, there are verses, there are things, there are rocks, there are journals. There are, but guess what? Your life can be a memorial stone. When your children, when your grandchildren, when you are long gone and they look back, they see the way you lived as a reminder of God who did wonders with a woman who chose to follow him, a woman of faith. Ladies, God's calling us to be women of faith. And I want to pray that the Holy Spirit will adjust us so that we see his holiness. We surrender and submit to him. That we live in consecration to him. Personal holiness. Not trying to gain salvation, but as an outflow that we are saved already. And then that action of faith to act on revealed truth. To step out in the direction. Not naming and claiming it. No, 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 no. Stepping out on revealed truth. What God has already said. To move forward in action, even though you don't understand why, or you may not see the big picture, but you're going to obey God anyway. And then remember it. God was doing a great thing in the children of Israel. He leadeth me. He leadeth me. By his own hand, he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be. For by his hand, he leadeth me. For God to lead, we have to follow. And we follow in faith. Trust in him enough to obey him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I, I just feel so burdened with this passage because I want us to get it, and yet I cannot make us get it. Only your Holy Spirit can. Father, I pray that we would just wrestle with you through the night. 
with the truth of this word. Father, I pray as we close for Lisa and Tony, for Melissa and Jonathan, for Ezra, for this church family, Father, that you would hold them and bless them and they would sense your peace and your presence, that you would give wisdom and direction and that you would give healing. And we pray that in the mighty, magnificent, holy name of Jesus. Amen.